15.000 km in tre mesi, attraversando l'Europa alla ricerca di makers. Fab Lab, Hackerspace, festival, eventi, 30 tappe, 8 nazioni e centinaia di progetti. Questo è il Maker Tour. I founded Snoot Lab uh, with Frédéric. We want to find projects, interesting ideas, interesting uh, experimentation that we do in our space and to uh, professionalize it. We used to do experiment and to build things with the Arduino, with the Maker movement and Arduino spaces. Um, then we were looking for to get the same um, momentum we had doing rocketry but trying to uh, live with it. Do it yourself is, is the part of the movement and do it yourself means what people used to do by themselves trying to put some, some pieces together to fix something was broken before. So it was very small group at the beginning. It will become mainstream, I think. I don't think it's properly kind of big revolution. It's just the fact of the dissemination and uh, the, the, the people teaching each other by the way of uh, open source and sharing is, is the fact. You have to change the paradigm of the, of the economy. But do by yourself doesn't mean you need to create a startup. Being able to share things and be happy doing it and sharing this with others doesn't mean you, you have to get a lot of money main office it's our toys yeah arduinos uh, shield we created uh, well we have many components things know. well it is based on arduino that is not a bullshit with uh, this you can drive uh, 800 gigabyte of ethernet uh, traffic per second people working in the government do not really understand what we are doing but uh, maybe it's better this way <laughs> <laughs> Because when you want to develop something new, you have to go over the limit. At the beginning, I wanted a place in, in Toulouse to, to create, to do some robotics, these kind of things. And um, I went to the US for a postdoc. In the lab, uh, I was using laser cutting, 3D printer, and I was thinking, yes, this is the kind of uh, things I want in, in France, in, in Toulouse. The Fab Lab itself could be a project because you need to, to get new machines, you need to get new partners. So there is 100 people in the Fab Lab, so all the time there is new things. In France there is more some hacker space, and, uh, but for, for the Fab Lab, uh, uh, at the beginning it was necessary to explain everything, and now we start to, to get some funding. And uh, now in France there is around 50, uh, 50 projects of Fab Lab. My dream, when I was a child, uh, to see the, the voice because I, I can hear, but I can see the voice. I print uh, in, in three dimensions a sentence. After, I will make, take a, a laser to read this sentence. En fait, j'ai construit l'imprimante 3D ici au Fab Lab, entièrement. Un modèle euh, sur Internet qui existait déjà, I can uh, buy uh, a 3D printer in a kit, and I will uh, do it my, myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's about uh, 500 uh, euros. We did this, uh, this plane with, uh, with laser cutting. The table was did with Arduino. More people will start to, to do this kind of thing. I mean, create some products, share with everyone and uh, collaborate with many, of many people. I think they, uh, they want to work differently. You can do what you want. You, I mean, you build directly, you control everything. And, uh, So it's not maybe for everyone, but this will change a, a lot of things, I think. Un mondo senza hacker sarebbe un mondo senza curiosità e innovazione. Ho la stessa impressione anch'io quando incontro Michelle e Jonathan durante l'Open Bid Will, il festival del Do It Yourself a Bordeaux, che ci accoglie dopo quattro giorni di viaggio. L'Abix è l'hacker space della città. Qui oggetti inutilizzati prendono vita nuovamente. The hacking is to transform things to be more efficient maybe, to help people to share 
is not to hack any website or anything like that. When you are in the Power Hack Lab, you bring uh, your knowledge, you bring your objects you want to modify, and you come to exchange your knowledge. So we have uh, some students, PhD students, graduates, or engineer students. We have a lot of artists. A Fab Lab is to make uh, systems from the beginning. And in the Hack Lab, it's more of taking something that's uh, obsolete, or you find in trash cans, or different kind of objects and make something else. This is hair quality egg to have a measure for quality hair. All these systems are come from Arduino. We have UAV, that is a drone with ArduPilot. We can help you to build your own project. So it's not, it's not an offer to an employment so it will not resolve the problem of not having a job but it can help people to live without having a job. Uh, we don't want to make business at all. That is the point. Uh, we want to share completely. The idea is do it yourself, okay, but we can do it for you. Uh, you can help guys to uh, propose services uh, around do it yourself. The EasyNet uh, collective uh, starts uh, in the hackerspace uh, uh, TMP Lab, so it's sort of hackerspace uh, oriented uh, hardware open source hardware. So it's not about uh, only uh, using technology, it's about uh, uh, what is changing in your life. Precisely this stuff, it's uh, an extruder. It's to make uh, our own uh, filament to uh, feed the reprap. So uh, we don't want uh, anymore uh, to, to, to buy the, the plastic, so we have to make it from the bottle of milk so uh, we can uh, shred it with a shred uh, document, document shredder. We push uh, the, uh, the plastic inside and after that it makes a filament. La communauté qu'on appelle Makers, c'est un pur uh, produit effectivement des, des, du monde du, du hack. Quand même uh, problématique, même pour les hackers et les makers, de se poser la question de ce qu'on utilise quotidiennement comme outil technologique. C'est-à-dire que quand on utilise un laptop, un appareil photo numérique, une tablette, euh, un téléphone portable. Euh, parfois, on est vraiment euh, amené à oublier comment c'est fabriqué, euh, toutes les implications sociales et politiques des objets techniques en général. À Usinet et puis même dans notre hackerspace au TMP Lab, on s'intéresse de comprendre comment les choses sont fabriquées, avoir conscience de, des problématiques, des absurdités du de comment sont fabriqués les objets techniques en général pour éventuellement euh, en déduire des alternatives. Mais c'est vraiment quand même pour l'instant très utopique de vouloir euh, changer les choses à court terme. Car à court terme, c'est ce que j'entends euh, la vie d'une personne. <rire> c'est ça le problème. Traveling through France after our first week of tour, we joined the Wish Share, the Collaborative Economy Festival. Startuppers, speakers, internet enthusiasts and makers, all in Paris hosted by Cabaret Sauvage, to share, think and believe in a different way to build society and a peer-to-peer -peer economic process for open source culture. We met Simone Cicero, one of the organizers of WeShare and member of Open Source Hardware World Association, and Jacopo Mistani, open source ecology co-founder in Italy. With them, we opened the dance. Wish uh, Fest uh, is uh, has been organized in a cooperative, extremely cooperative way, in an experimental way, and the contents uh, are uh, ranging from peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, marketplaces, co collaborative consumption, uh, makers, and uh, open manufacturing, social innovation stuff. So it's been pr pretty, you know, pretty large scope. The situation of open source ecology in Italy. We start working in our national borders until. I don't know, at the beginning of 2012. Uh, actually, we have developed some of the machine of the Global Village construction set, that is the Kita 15 industrial machine, uh, developed from the open source ecology movement at the international level. So we are now uh, readapting uh, the kit to our cultural context. We are also now preparing ourselves to open a a small business, a startup, a new, a new model, a small factory, an open source manufacturing facility. And we also have developed a 
way uh, that we will, imp will implement in our small business to give uh, to the market, the traditional market, the solution they need. And we have a kit solution and the DIY traditional solution. With the concept of making, we can uh, actually download something or just read an article and try to figure out a solution for fix the problem in a specific case or simply doing it for fun. So it could be both a cultural revolution and a manufacturing revolution. Uh, we have invited a lot of uh, what we call fab spaces. So basically every place that's full of creation and creativity is welcome to participate in the event. All of those people invited work during one day simultaneously on the same topic. We have uh, 17 fab spaces participating. They will be working on the same topic, trying to find a solution or maybe more a creative design uh, on a topic of the um, urban farming. So we have fab labs from Saudi Arabia, from Peru, from uh, Togo, from Belgium, Poland, France, Spain. Everybody will be connected, everybody will see each other. And the aim is actually to have fun and to build a, a community to bring people closer instead of just being closed in the little fab lab and thinking that, oh, we're the only ones doing that. My interest in this Wisha Fest and the WikiHouse project is to see how the next to the makers, we have also the, this open source uh, movement and which is how to make it available to everyone and how to get everyone involved in it. So how to build community around it, how to make it local. And this is the kind of thing that interests me so far. I don't think we're gonna change the world by the makers movement because it's just, uh, it has been like that. We, we are just realizing that maybe what we were uh, searching for, what we were going for, may not be the best solution. Uh, we went through uh, a mass consumption era from our parents' generation uh, where we just lost, we forgot about things. And what is the new thing about the maker movement is movement, is the, the community. The internet makes the echo way larger than it has ever been. Nei vari progetti c'è anche quello della Wikihouse. Uno dei suoi sviluppatori, Alistair Parvin, ci spiega cos'è. Wikihouse is an experiment we began about a year and a half ago into open source construction. So basically the project is trying to make it possible for you to share files online which anyone can download um, and effectively print out parts for a house which you can then put together a bit like what you can see they're doing behind me. We haven't yet built the first fully lived in house. We hope that's going to be happening soon. But what we have built is succession of small little prototypes like these where we're just developing the system to make it really work better and better and better. If we're going to be talking seriously about the issues that we are talking about, like climate change and affordability and inequality, then we need some ways to be able to diffuse the solutions to all those people who are making cities for themselves. So it's not, we can share it with the whole community and everybody shares that purpose. Everybody gets that, it's a very simple aim. Solve the problem for yourself and then share it and it'll make it easier for someone to do, copy it and adapt it the next time somewhere else. Why you choose to be a maker? I sort of always tinkered and made stuff, but uh, later I discovered that all the digital fabrication uh, machine and fab labs, and I dived into that, uh, that stuff. What are you doing with uh, your fab lab? We are fixing broken uh, device or appliance. We are building uh, music instruments. We are making various sort of things. So it's an open source 3D printer, but uh, I have the need of a portable machine. Uh, this one is foldable. You can, uh, all the X, Y uh, gantry, you can fold it back and then you have something like a suitcase. This one I can travel with it uh, and all over the world. And I make things for demonstration or just to, uh, uh, in coach surfing, I came to a place and I find a little problem and I fix it uh, with a 3D printer. We have to bring you on our bar camper. <laughs> it's something that could, couldn't have been made uh, with classical methods. It can Why? only be printed because all the parts I made at once. You're inside the maker movement and uh, what do you think uh, uh, they could be able, you could be able to do a really huge revolution? Uh, thanks to this um, access of uh, digital fabrication, we can uh, prototype way faster than before. 
Parigi. Ci spostiamo dal Wisher Festival al saint Catre, spazio polifunzionale, artistico e sociale che nasce sulle ceneri di un'ex rimessa per carrozze funebri e si trasforma in un luogo in cui le persone si incontrano e scoprono un nuovo modo di stare insieme e creare cultura. Al suo interno c'è Le Nouvelle Fabrique, non un semplice fab lab, come ci spiega Vincent, uno dei suoi creatori. This is a collaborative place, working place. Inspired by Fab Lab, but not only, we work on this idea of a new factory, micro factoring in the town. Is it possible in the next years to have places like a share garden, you have a share workshop for people. The idea of the project is not only uh, numerical tools, but how it's possible to make a place, a workplace. Uh, we're going to make links, strong links with uh, the, the activities of the neighborhood. Uh, I'm not from design. I make a studio of law for a long time, so I not come from this, but we, I think we share this, the same idea. I don't know, maybe you know this, uh, this guy called uh, John Ruskin, he said that uh, the best value of the, the work is not the money you're going to earn, but the, the way you're going to be transformed by the work. And this is maybe what we are not trying to do, but uh, the philosophy we, we share with uh, people who work here. Uh, what do you think about uh, the maker movement? Because uh, uh, usually in a fab lab uh, you meet makers and people that want to do by it yourself. I, I think this is normal movement. This is not uh, exceptional because we know that in, uh, in the 70s, in the 15s, there was this idea of return to, return to, the, to, the, to the real life, you know. It is a cycle and we come back to this idea of yes, we need to make things with hands. Um, making, I think, is self-organized. Um, uh, I don't have time to go into a lot of it, but the growth of maker spaces and fab labs around the world um, are showing us that, that this is a sort of a network uh, of communities that are growing and even within those communities, but it's largely decentralized. Maybe it's idealistic, but uh, the sense of sharing, uh, I think, is a cultural value. What is the base of the maker community? I think the base of the community, really, or the core of it, is, is really just um, people who are uh, making things. Uh, I think of them mostly as hobbyists and amateurs, people that um, love what they're doing. And they've probably done this most of their life. But I think once uh, sort of the makers began coming together, they see new opportunities and new ways of doing things. and they begin enjoying the sort of social side of making as well as the personal side of making. My original title for the magazine was Hacks Magazine, but I used the word make and, and I think partially because it's, it's, it's understandable by most people. Um, to make is, is, uh, is something we could apply to food and, and shelter as well as uh, a lot of other things. And I, I found it opened the door to more people to participate. Whatever we call it, hacking or making, existed pre-existed this maker movement. It's always been around and, and that Maker Fair is sort of a catalyst for, for uh, getting more people to participate, more people aware of makers. My hope is we see Maker Fair in Europe, we'll see more of that come to light. Because revolution tends to imply um, uh, a rapid change. I think this is a deeper, longer term change that might take generations to, to realize, and so more evolution than revolution. So I, I do believe that the maker movement is a source of innovation and a source of innovators. What's interesting to me is it's a non-traditional source. Like we tend to think of companies doing research and development. We think of academia having you know, large in institutes for, for studying problems and solving problems. But what if people are able to do that on their own independently in, in small communities? What we see online is when you make something and you begin to share it, you begin to make connections in a social network to other people that have interest in that. Sometimes as buyers of what you're doing, sometimes as uh, other people who are producing similar things. Joining projects, working on projects, is I, I think the, the new kind of job. Almost the most profound change that making can have on our world is to really help transform education and, the, and to really shift in some ways from a school-based model to a community model around education that we profoundly learn from 
working with other people and, and working in, in small groups on projects. You know, my goal through education has been to make more makers. You can be active, you can create, you can make things, and in a sense, you're shaping and building the world. The world around us was made by people. Hi, my name is Stefania. Uh, I'm uh, one of the founders of Hackidemia. Uh, and uh, we created a mobile invention lab for children. So uh, we go around the world and we teach them about digital fabrication, physical computing, making, and showing them how they can learn by doing and by playing. The goal of Hackidemia is to uh, create local impact and local change with the children and with the young people. So the idea is that after they learn how to solder, or how to use Arduino or how to code, they can use that to solve problems in their community. For example, when we went to Nigeria, we taught them how to make a solar panel because they always have problems of access to energy. And we can imagine that children learn very fast and they like to explore and uh, they are not afraid of change. So they are the best actors of change in their community. At Visher Festival, Hackademia uh, has done a musical room so the idea is that children could create a room in which every object would make music. Uh, and after that we did uh, an experiment with Explora and showed them how they could uh, use all the sensors from Explora to record the data and see how hot is it at uh, we share, what kind of weather do we have, can we share that data from the sensors with children in other countries so they see what's the environment that we share. How do you think is revolutionary what makers are doing today? Um, I believe that the makers movement is a step forward in the change we want to see in the world and it applies at all levels. Uh, manufacturing, education, social impact and I think until now people were spending a lot of time talking about problems, talking about ideas, talking about solutions and now we're finally doing it. Uh, and what I like the most about the makers movement is that these people are doers. They don't only think and have big ideas but they also implement them and they are confronted with the reality of the field where it's very hard to actually make a change or it's very hard to implement a big idea. I am trying to, to make it grow very fast and that's why I decided to work with young people uh, because I think they are the future and if they understand where this revolution could take us they will put a lot of energy into it and they will learn all about um, making and digital fabrication. I'm really excited to be part of this movement. I think we have a lot of cha challenges for scaling and for growing in the right way. Uh, I don't know exactly where it's going to take us, but um, uh, I'm enjoying the ride. Il nostro viaggio tra Fab Lab fa tappa a Genevilliers, a nord di Parigi. Qui Loren ed Emmanuel avviano dopo un primo esperimento alla Roche-sur-Yon il Fac Lab, un grande spazio con macchine e tecnologie dove ci si incontra per realizzare un progetto, pranzare insieme o semplicemente scambiare idee. One of my dreams would be to be able to use the Fac Lab because we're building it, uh, we bring people in it, we talk about it and we don't have time to actually use it. And uh, the one the good thing that happens here is that whenever I show up here, uh, it, it charges my batteries. Uh, we are actually very community first. Uh, we tend to try to have people talk to each other and exchange the knowledge they have. And it can be anything. It can be a recipe. It can be how to sew something. It can be writing in French or in English to help somebody else correct what they are doing. It's first, let's get the community. People have individual projects, no problem, show up, we've got machines, enjoy them, no problem. But if you could talk to each other and exchange a bit, that would be nice. I think it's very interesting here is that you meet all kinds of people coming for, from different fields with uh, many different skills. And uh, you ought to ask questions, as I said, even if it seems to be a very silly question, you don't have, uh, you don't fear to be simple-minded. I choose to come because uh, there were a lot of uh, machines that I didn't know. <laughs> I know the sewing machine, <laughs> that's the thing I know. And uh, I wanted to learn more about 3D, about the laser cut, for instance, and uh, to meet the people. You learn a you learn with other, you know, you learn yourself. Je suis en train de mettre un, de faire un fab lab. 
avec un espace de coworking. Et l'idée, c'est que les gens, les professionnels, vont pouvoir, utiliser, vont pouvoir partager leurs connaissances avec des particuliers. Euh, je pense que ça, va, que ça va se transformer en, en ce genre. Ça va, ça va faire une révolution. Mais aujourd'hui, ce n'est vraiment que des gens et une communauté qui partagent et, euh, et s'entraident. Plus tard, ça pourrait faire une révolution, mais on n'en est pas encore là aujourd'hui. The plus, the plus here is that you have, you have a, diverse, a diversity of profiles. If you are in a usual lab, you will meet researcher. And here we have got some childs, we have got some mothers, we have got some people that uh, stop to work, people that are looking for work. So they will try to do and they may be sometimes discovering that uh, what we thought was impossible is effectively impossible but is interesting to, to, to snag around. But I think we are, we are at the verge of, of, of a huge uh, shift into the way the society uh, works. So um, the maker movement won't be a solution to unemployment because we will have to rethink what is employment. Um, my vision of, of the maker movement and the Fab Labs is uh, that the good size for a Fab Lab to, to be implanted in, in a re an area is to be in a small town of 2,000 people and that will work here and meet here and, and have relationships together and, and think together. And it's a, it's a comeback to, to what existed into the, the pubs and so on that, that uh, in some place are closed now. What is enthusiastic is that people are definitely open-minded and they are very creative in different fields and they are warm people, they are welcoming you wherever you are coming from, by them. <laughs> so now my next objective is really to learn how to use this Arduino because on the, the costume you have seen uh, all the electronic and Arduino things has been made of and fixed, it, uh, fixed by Adele, by other people than me. And I hope that I will be free to do it by myself very soon. Those little uh, clusters are growing and then you are uh, linked with different networks. And I think that could be really uh, a leading affair in the, in the year to come. What we call the third industrial revolution is already happening. It will not be a revolution when we put everything into a dumpster and change the whole society. That's not going to happen like that. For me, uh, society is kind of an onion and you add new layers to the onion. So we'll still build on what we used to do in the past with the industrial society the way we know it. But today we are adding new layers, new, co new behaviors, new ways of building, creating, exchanging. And some of them will die, some of them will grow. 1049 km solo andata da Parigi a Berlino, il viaggio del Maker Tour a Prada in Germania ed è qui che vivremo tre giorni di Codemotion, l'evento dedicato agli amanti di web e open source. Il festival parla al femminile. Le prime voci che ascoltiamo sono quelle di Mika, Anna e Zoe. Le prime fanno parte del collettivo Cobacant. Insieme esplorano le risorse del tessile unendole a tecnologie e design. Zoe è parte del team Arduino, esperta di open source e moda collaborativa. Sono loro che danno vita al primo workshop dell'evento dedicato ad Arduino Lilipad, la tecnologia che si indossa. I studied graphic design and media art, so like I don't know if you can call an artist as a maker, but like of course as in the practice you do make a lot of things and I think it's just an extension of what I was doing. Well, I think I really enjoy playing with materials and they kind of triggers ideas and then making like small projects often just like making something, kind of documenting it and, and sharing it to show what's possible. Hacking, but also the, the aesthetics and the materials play a big role to me, so how it then ends up kind of looking and feeling. Textile and, and electronics is an interesting combination and if you use textile it's another kind of language as an aesthetic and also outcome so it's quite interesting to explore this. I mean industry is probably always influenced by what's happening in the world and the fact that there's a maker movement of, yeah will probably also influence industry but yeah I think the more interesting is the communities and the way that we might make things together now more. I don't know is there a goal or is everything is a process? <laughs> no the goal is that the process should be enjoyable but then at the same time it never is because it's always frustrating and <laughs> but when it's finished you, you it's, it's so rewarding that you go through it again anyway. <laughs>
Mm. Well, I think this moment of it works is a very emotional point for a lot of people who make things and yeah, that is in the code too, I think. So we started to realize how do-it-yourself and uh, um, self-organizing could help really to uh, create a new env environment for creative workers to find their road and to invent their own job. And uh, um, going on, we realized how new technology are, are also helping uh, us. You just need a little theory to start prototyping some ideas that could become then products that then you can sell in small batches. The important thing about the Arduino is a whole environment where actually it's not really only the hardware, it's about also the software and especially it's about the community. So yes, it is do it yourself, but it's more like do it together. We need to start from our desire and then start to find solution uh, in a common-based environment. Maker Faire is an important event because it gives uh, young people and also people that don't know a, a lot about this, uh, this uh, movement to get in touch with the people and be inspired and maybe start their own project or start their own experimentation. Well, I've been to the Maker Faire in the US and they're very inspiring. I was impressed by how many people make an effort to come to the same place to see other people's work, to share their work. And it's just also, because it's nice, it's, it's entertaining. And so coming to Maker Faire Rome would be to see people from all over Europe coming to Rome. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Massimo Panzi. Well, I am a geek, and uh, it all started when I was a little kid. Things that we try to do with Arduino is to keep the design very simple and share it. So the idea for Arduino is really that you plug the USB cable, you download the software, and within half an hour you, have, you start building something. Well, obviously one advantage that we have in the maker community compared to the sort of, you know, 1970s electronics magazines is that there is, the community has the internet as a communication vehicle. Sort of easiness of creation of content is obviously what powers this community. So in a way the Arduino community has this sort of uh, advantage of being born around 2004 when, you know, the internet was in full power, lots of people used it to create content, blogging. So the question is really that things that start as a joke, they then start to, uh, in a way, trigger the imagination of other people and you start to create uh, uh, based on that. So there's, I think, this sort of exploration and sort of hobby style, sort of playing around with stuff, can transition to real innovation. So you have people who make a lot of Internet of Things projects, so they try to take everyday objects, connect them to the Internet and see what happens, create a you know, biology lab. The applications are so many that it's very difficult to pinpoint or just a few. We are still at the beginning. If there is a revolution, it's still to come. But you can sort of see, kind of down there, that something interesting will come up. In the Maker Faire, essentially it provides you with, um, uh, in a way, a selection of the best work done by makers. And last year there were 100,000 people that visited the Maker Faire in one weekend. We felt there was uh, the, the need for a kind of an event like Maker Faire that could really cross between countries because in Europe it's more difficult to do these kind of things because you, uh, you know, different cultures, different languages, uh, ideas sometimes travel less efficiently than uh, in the US. Uh, you have a dream. <laughs> well, many dreams, yeah. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I read once is that if you have a dream, if you talk about it too much, uh, then your brain starts to feel you already achieved it and you lose, you know, the, the passion. <laughs> so you have a dream, you keep it to yourself until it's real. So what happened and why you decided to open the Fab Lab? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's impossible to open up a Fab Lab by yourself. So the idea was really to find other people who are equally interested in this topic. So in Germany, there was kind of maybe a scene of people who were more these kind of classical electronic nerds. So yeah, you first had to find people who were looking for the same kind of stuff and you spread the word. And we have people of very different backgrounds. So we have the classic nerd who, who built their quadcopters. We have now crafters. We have lots of kids coming around which just learn technology. We, we 
building a kind of a bike which has a laser and a 3D printer mounted on it so we can uh, cross the city and, and go, go to places, show people the thing, have them make things. First of all, you have the global movement, which is uh, like the, all these ideas that are freely shared. And so you see somebody does this in, uh, in the US and then open sources it so you can do it here. But at the same time, you have much more this kind of local community building, which happens. This is the amazing stuff now. We are now uh, over a hundred members. And so you suddenly get to know people that have been living in your neighborhood and uh, you didn't know that they're actually doing the same stuff as you do. So I like the idea that you can repair your own stuff, build your own things. It's this kind of counterculture for this consumerism. Why you will participate, if you will, to the Make a Fair Rome? Oh, it's, it's super inspirational to see what other people are doing, to exchange ideas, to, I mean, and to feel this community. Like, oh my God, I'm not the only one that have weird ideas. So there are even weirder ideas. So I think that's the fantastic part of me meeting physically and not just virtually on the internet. Berlino, secondo giorno di Codemotion. Tra i makers incontriamo Alessandro Contini. Tra design, suono e tecnologia si definisce un factotum dell'era digitale e dopo tante collaborazioni con aziende internazionali avvia progetti personali. Uno di questi è Audu, un'applicazione per catturare e condividere con micro guide come fare le cose. Un altro modo per diventare maker. We developed a, um, an iPhone app and it's a tool uh, to create tutorials and micro guides on the fly with your phone. So we are really into understanding uh, the variety of people involved in the maker community and it's, it's awesome, like uh, what I really love uh, being part of the maker community is the wheel of making things happen basically. Mm, and it's not depending on your background, you're just anyone is trying to make something and it's for sure we are like putting a lot of effort uh, in sharing and that's one of the main parts of our platform. Uh, the reason why you're doing your tutorial and sharing with others, it's, it's because you want to share it with others, basically. Uh, I think we will see great things happening thanks to the open source. Uh, many of these things already happen in the software world. Now they are happening in the hardware world. That's very interesting. Uh, I've just been to Maker Faire UK. We used our uh, tool uh, with some makers to do tutorials on how they were making their stuff. And it's awesome with kids, of course, um, how they can explain you to do something and why they explain, they learn how to do that thing. Make a fair is a unique experience. We are going to make a fair Rome um, because we really want to push this tool to makers. We, we really believe in it, we think it's very helpful for them and um, we hope they will like it. I mean, I will invite everyone to go to a Maker Faire at least once, even if it's the wrong one or another one. Go to Maker Faire, it's awesome. Codemotion nasce eh, tre anni fa come Codemotion, però in realtà nasce molto prima, dopo quattro edizioni del Java Day. Tre anni fa abbiamo deciso di aprire a tutti i linguaggi e tecnologie. Abbiamo cercato un nome, Codemotion era il nome che meglio ci rappresentava perché eh, per noi il codice è anche emozione e pensiamo che eh, sia impossibile creare un software, creare un'applicazione eh, veramente di successo se dietro non c'è una grande passione. Si è trasformato crescendo tanto ma cercando di mantenere quell'identità di evento focalizzato sui contenuti e sull'obiettivo della condivisione. Ora è un evento internazionale quindi lo organizziamo a Madrid, adesso siamo alla prima edizione a Berlino, abbiamo 5 track tematiche per ogni giorno, quindi in totale 10, sui principali topic legati alla tecnologia, quindi web, mobile, big data, coding, programming languages e poi abbiamo un'intera track dedicata al mondo maker e un'intera track dedicata al creative coding. È un mix di tante realtà diverse, quindi è un ottimo punto di incontro e anche di networking. Forse un nostro goal sarà, sarà quello di riuscire a mantenere dei rapporti con le community forti, perciò la nostra sfida sarà quella di mantenere sempre l'evento con dei contenuti di qualità talmente alti che le community si avvicineranno, avvicineranno di conseguenza all'evento. È faticoso ma ce la stiamo facendo.
Eh, io quando parlo con le persone racconto che ci sarà questa Maker Sfera a Roma e sarà una, sarà una grandissima fiera, sono attese tantissime persone, sarà in un posto bello che è il Campo Boario. Vedo che c'è comunque un interesse perché mh, è proprio questo avvicinarsi al, alla creazione, cioè questa cosa l'ha fatta lui ma la potrei fare anch'io, sono un curiosito lo posso fare. Ci sono veramente delle interfacce che ti permettono di fare tutto in maniera molto semplice. Bisogna studiare un pochino, quello sì, però non è così difficile. We have um, a bigger desire to promote the creative communities, for example, creative coding, because that's just kind of like what the communities here are interested in now. For example, using things like Arduino and processing and creating visuals and audio together uh, to take something that normally could be seen as a little bit boring, for example, and to turn it into something artistic, artistic and creative is like that's kind of, in my opinion, what I want this conference to be about, what I think a lot of people here came here to see. You're from Open Tech School. Uh, what do you do inside the school? Okay, well, it's not an, a formal school, as it, as it sounds like, Open Tech School. It's just basically a group of people who come together and create workshops and learning opportunities um, and definitely promoting um, the minorities. Basically, it's just a platform for people to come together and learn together and share knowledge. So the Open Tech School is a community initiative that runs workshops on tech and coding. Um, so we basically help people get into the scene and get started with, with coding. For us it, it is uh, specifically about the fact that if you know uh, a technology or a specific uh, yeah, tech topic you can teach it to others and, uh, and make sure that uh, that knowledge is spread and shared by everybody. Um, Um, so yeah, just that community feeling and, and uh, way of, of self-organizing and self-improving. Uh, um, With us communities like us, you can learn how to do small things, fix your own problems, and you're not dependent on, on, on the companies doing everything for you. We also all have this curiosity of, of how things work, and there I can actually see how things work from, from the ground up, so how do they get built, how, how does it start. We are interested in maker movement, uh, what do you think about them? I mean, it's hard to say, I think that it's kind of like um, the beginning of the future, basically, or, you know, the middle of the future, obviously the future is, you know. So my name is Andrei Nichipurenko, I'm a software developer working in the, by the uh, large industrial company. And as my hobby project, what I'm doing is uh, I'm building robots. So the project is the open source robotic vehicle, which we are positioning mainly either just for fun, where you can, uh, as a typical maker project, or you can also consider it as a platform for researchers and makers and for educational purposes. This freedom and uh, ability to uh, realize your ideas in the very fast and uncomplicated way for example uh, using the 3d building uh, 3d te printing technology it's very easy to build something physical what you want to have uh, which is exactly fit your your particular needs for particular project needs and the second important point i think is the sharing of the information mm -hmm. the free access to the achievement somebody else already made so you sh you can start not Uh, not from the uh, zero level, not from the beginning, but base your work on someone else and just try to uh, reach the new level, new horizon, without reinventing again and again already known thing. I will come to the Maker Fair because uh, I like the atmosphere, I like to make new contacts, to talk to the like-minded people, so it's just uh, on the human, on the communication level it's very then maybe attract somebody else to join the project so it's about community building it's it's really important point so my name is Johanna Brewer and I am the, a co-founder of freestyle.com which is a startup that helps people discover live music I think I've been a maker my whole life my father's an engineer so I grew up soldering playing with circuits and electronics And I think for me, making, it's like a buzzword now and everyone is a maker and it's a new concept. But I think for me, it's something that's inside of you. If you're a DIY person, you want to know how things work. You want to get into a machine and understand it. That's 
for me my whole life. So whether it's an electronic machine, it's a piece of plumbing, it's my car, it's code, I want to know how it works and I want to be able to build it myself. Yeah, I think the maker movement compared to just DIY in general is very different because there's this added community factor, you're right. DIY is more of a mindset, I think. You know, it's just I like to get in and I like to mess with stuff. But the maker movement is really about sharing the way that the maker movement allows people to rethink how they interact with their technologies. One of the things that I'm doing, I'm a bit involved with the Open Tech School, and I'm trying to help run a workshop helping people break open their devices and fix what's wrong with them. And I think the maker movement is helping that sort of uh, tangentially, but it's the idea that they're not black boxes anymore. And I think that my, my dream isn't such a grand vision, but it's one in which the, the technologies we use, whether it's digital, whether it's your car, whether it's a washing machine, people have a better understanding of what goes on inside of them, even if they don't know how to fix them and that it doesn't seem so scary. But I think the coolest thing about going to a maker fair is getting your mind into the space of thinking of the possibilities you haven't really seen before because everybody is using you know, their skills to solve problems that interest them. And they can be pretty niche and pretty crazy, but that can inspire you a lot. Dopo tre settimane di viaggio siamo a Berlino. Al Code Motion conosciamo Wolf. È lui che insieme ad un gruppo di altri makers fonda il Fab Lab Berlin. Wolf ci invita nel MIT, dove scopriamo il loro quartier generale. Last year I did a research journey in the United States for three months, so I saw over 10 different Fab Labs, did also interviews about their business models, educational models. Um, and so on. And then when I came back to Berlin, I had to decide if I want to start one myself. And I thought, okay, if I invested all this time, I have to give it a try at least. So here I am and it's going pretty well right now. So we um, try to build up capacity. We also try to train the members. So at the Open Lab Day, there's more people who can work with the machines and explain that uh, to people who are new to the Fab Lab and who have questions. So you uh, already knew before coming here in the Fab Lab the maker movement or was something new that you was knowing? No, for a couple of years already I, I followed the blogs, I followed the movement mostly in the United States and what brought me there was that I started working in the university in the rapid prototyping. I'm here a bit responsible for the equipment for the workshop organization. I'm also offering a workshop. I transform action figures into uh, something else. And I offer this workshop to introduce people into 3D printing. What do you think that is the plus, the special thing of the maker movement? The really um, special thing is that people who haven't been able to do high quality uh, products they become able to do something that is really useful for their life. It can change the structure from, from, uh, from the bottom. Yeah, it maybe change the, the thinking of the people about products. Probably the combination of inventing, sharing, but also making things. So maybe I haven't thought about the difference between an inventor and a maker, but maybe yes, maybe an inventor invents something and then he gets a patent and finds a company who makes it. So I think a maker would always try to start producing it himself and then either be successful or fail, but it's all, it's, it's, it's very hands-on and um, experience-based also. You just try things and if, if it's successful, you keep going. If, if you fail, you try something else. The transition between digital and physical um, becomes dissolved. So I'm pretty sure that this will have a big impact on industry and also on um, education probably. I think there will always be industrial processes for some things. I would expect at a maker fair to, to see the status quo of makers in Europe. Um, also for networking of course. Um, also because I think it's going to be fun and because it's going to be amazing to see all the crazy stuff that people come up with and that they show us. Tra Berlino e Parigi incontriamo più volte Sam, neozelandese, ormai adottato dall'Europa. È qui che un anno fa avvia il suo progetto, Year of Open Source, 
sperimentare 365 giorni autoproducendo ogni oggetto e bene necessario in modo del tutto open source. When you started to do this kind of project, what happened to your life? I was trying to find ways to build upon work that is in the commons, that people have put into the commons um, through uh, open source or public domain licenses or copyleft licenses and then building on that work to create my own works and putting that then into the conference for other people to build on as well. Can you explain me what kind of projects you did till today? Um, uh, a number of different areas where I've kind of thrown myself into different areas. So um, education, for example, I couldn't program, never programmed anything before and I decided that, that would be a good chance to try open education. But I've also needed to think about physical things and so one obvious thing um, when looking into kind of things you're going to need to buy throughout the year is clothing. Um, and clothing, there isn't actually a problem with copyright there, but I thought there's no real open source movement with clothing. You can't kind of, there's no 3D printer where you can just print out a new suit or anything like that. And so I wanted to distinguish between DIY and open source, and, that, and I thought if I was to make patterns for clothing, and I was to share that with other people, then they would only fit people with the exact same body shape as, as me. Um, and I wanted to make sure that everybody would be able to adapt my, uh, my pattern for other people. And so, of course, I went back to the co-sewing space and sewed my very own <laughs> open source underwear as well, which, of course, fit me perfectly, so that's all very nice. And so I thought this was a good opportunity to combine the idea of working with the public domain and also um, uh, creating my own goods. So I went on public domain review. <laughs> and uh, so this was done on this 1980s um, uh, knitting machine, which has been hacked so that it's um, now useful. And uh, this is also a reversible hat that's built on a um, design made by Fabien Sedier, who was the artist who I was making this with. And what we also did is turn it inside out. It's no. a reversible hat, you've got a QR code there so that you can read that and that will take you to the source code of the hat as well. So wow. basically when you scan that in, it takes you to my website where you see the video of us making the hat. And it's definitely changed the way I, I approach, um, if I, if I th feel that I need a new thing, you know, if, I, if, I, uh, if something breaks, then the automatic assumption is, okay, well, I'd better go and buy a new one. But certainly now, uh, having gone through this process, now I tend to think, okay, do I need to buy a new one, or can I repair this one, or can I create my own one, or can I adapt something else to serve the same purpose? I uh, have realized that um, this is a process that never is really kind of finished, you know, and, and so my, my year of open source is basically not really going to finish either. It's kind of becoming a bit of a, a life of open source. The university knows that we are here after three years, so every year we have a girls' day where young girls come and we try to convince them, please become engineers or computer scientists. And when we show them the Fab Lab, it's a good way of um, yeah, making them come to our university. But uh, there are so many projects uh, where the university might benefit from the Fab Lab and we did not really, uh, th there should be more of a collaboration between. Every Tuesday we open for free to the general public and they can use the machines that we have here. And the second thing that we do is research and we give lectures for computer science and we bring our students to physical computing and to personal fabrication. The visitors, we help them to build spare parts for their cars, for their everyday objects, for the fridge. And we help them as good as we can, but we're not designers, we're computer scientists and it's really just like helping them doing it themselves. And the other big project that we have is FabScan, the 3D scanner that you can build yourself for 100 euros. Do it yourself, laser cutter, all open source, software and hardware for 100 euros. So we use Arduino in every single project. As I said, I come from professional embedded systems design, so I did assembler and all the C stuff and I still like to do it, but whenever I try to tinker with a new sensor, with a new motor, I just use an Arduino and do it within seconds or minutes. Uh, but I think the stronger idea is that we are one community, of, of a global community of makers, and people don't have to bring all the knowledge themselves, but they, f they find friends, and someone is good in electronics, the other one is a mechanical engineer, and somebody is just 
a, a brilliant creative person with a good idea about design and if they meet and do it together I think this is the, the best situation that you will find and this is what the Maker Movement is about I think. There are two stories, my story and the fabulous story. My story is that I started the, the developing, researching and designing how to work with online communities to make them collaborate online using open source and peer-to-peer -peer practices. And I use design for doing that, so using design for replicating open source communities. And of course one of these applications is open design, so having open source principle in design. And Fabulous are one of the best places for doing that because you actually have a place where you can transform in something physical in an object what we've been working digitally and collaborated online in a digital format. In 2009 I was invited to a conference here as a keynote speaker and then that's why I basically I went into contact with this university. And then in, at the beginning of 2011 I, I came here and started doing research. So I've been working in developing the Fab Lab, I'm also working in organizing the Open Knowledge Festival. I'm also lecturing in digital fabrication for the students. So all these things are going on and taking place here. One is the Fab Lab should be open to the public. Here it's open during the Tuesday usually. It's open to anybody. Then another thing that's important is that you should share the same processes and tools with other Fab Labs. So we have visited Fab Lab in Amsterdam, in Barcelona, and in Manchester to learn what they were doing and to basically learn from them. On one side, the Maker Movement has been always active. I mean, people are always able to manufacture things on their own because until the 50s or the 60s, normally people were, work, were living outside of big cities. So they were used to have their workshop and working on their things. And now we have a lot of course of people working with electronics or digital arts and digital medium. And these things are mixing, so we have more modern makers, let's say, they were basically working with hands, but also with digital uh, medium. This is done with the temperature uh, of Helsinki. This is a visualization of that. This is a visualization of the sun data over Helsinki in one year. So this is about all the sun that is coming to Helsinki in one year. This again is another 3D visualization of wind data. This has been since emailed. And about open source, at least what the students are doing in the courses about digital fabrication, they're releasing at open source because they work together in the same place at the same time. So it's also very difficult that you can uh, make this a secret because they're working on the same things. They can uh, share with, with each other so they can know what each other is doing. So they can also help each other. So that's also the principle in the Fab Lab. And make a movement can enable people to uh, adjust and fix their broken things. On one side, it is possible a way for having more localized production. One thing that is very important, they can enable people to actually learn a lot about developing their own things. And when you learn how to develop and make something physical, then you understand how much does it take to develop a product. Why to come to the Maker Fair room for people that could come? It's absolutely for sure the, the biggest Maker Fair in Europe. So you don't have to travel to USA to really visit the Maker Fair. And it will be a place where you can meet people from all the other places of Europe. That's a very good moment where you can discover more uh, projects, more uh, approaches to different projects, and also to know and meet more people which we, with which you can collaborate in the future. These moments are really important for learning more from other people and building things for the future. I'm Martin Genet. I'm following the course uh, Digital Fabrication Studio. The aim of the course is to make a project out of the, um, the material uh, provided in Fab Labs. What we're doing here is, for the, for the moment, is exercising on machines and learn to uh, work with them. What I, when I came here, it was mostly to work at this uh, very one-to-one -one scale or uh, not not only on the paper and doing some rendering for architecture. I really enjoy it, like, the fact that you can actually work all around the world like this. It's quite a nice idea for the open design. So, no, it actually has already begun to sort of bring something new in, in uh, design and design market. About the industry, make it a little bit more global and local at the same time. It's a network, uh, 
and you can find uh, local people and working on local projects but you can have influence from, from the global uh, that's quite cool uh, I'm Eugenia Pavone, I'm from France. Uh, I study architecture in Paris and here I just came for spatial design for one year in Erasmus. We are studying architecture, so it's just architecture studies. And here you have the opportunity to take courses like uh, from graphic design, packaging, you can take also industrial. So there is like this multi courses that it's really nice because you can add more knowledge. In my school they're going to build the Fab Lab. We have a department digital knowledge. And students they want to build this Fab Lab but right now the only machine we have is laser cutter. It's, it's the same as this one. Do it yourself. So there are like uh, Anu and Ali and also Massimo that they can help you if you have a problem. So it's like really friendly environment if you have a problem or anything. But it's really nice because you can basically with all the machines test and making prototypes and it's really nice so you can learn by yourself. It's like learning by doing as we say. My goal before coming here I've been preparing like for uh, several years because I wanted, I, I was sure to come here because I really want to experience design and also because I think Alto is the only school that you can take as many courses as you want. You, you have these makers, they're uploading their stuff uh, on the internet and if you want to update like uh, I don't know a 3D doc then you can download it and then add more things to it and it's, it's pretty nice. You're making a project, you have to document it. So my name is Ville Huvenen and I'm a, a technical director and chairman of the board of Pixel Lake Festival but for a living I do aerial cinematography with uh, these self-built drones. Why you started to create this festival and uh, what it's about? Well we started 10 years ago with, uh, with a guy named Juan Huskonen. We both were from the early 90s 16 and 8-bit computer kind of underground and we noticed that there was lots of people doing creative things with electronics and computers but who didn't identify themselves as an artist first and foremost. So that's why often the work was unfinished. So we wanted to create this forum for, for people and like, like ourselves. When we, it has actually evolved quite a lot. When we, when we started the VJing thing was actually really new but now they during the years VJs have become quite mainstream so our focus has shifted more much more towards like let's say like activism social activism hackerism like DIY do it with others electronics so now in the beginning we had much more like clubs and shows but nowadays we have much more like seminars like bar camp style and workshops for people who are interested in Arduino or so. So it has evolved because more and more people can afford to, to have these tools, tech, digital tools and like build things. This work that I'm doing now is kind of a proof of concept already that the aerial filming that's uh, they started as a hobby four years ago and now we're actually doing it as our work and we basically self-built this using a 3D printer and a milling machine and the thing is that actually now we are traveling with this so there is no any like big industrial company that could actually make this there is still no market for mass producing these the festival goal is to be kind of reactive and organic but for myself well currently we are kind of met the goal that we are like able to travel with, with the helicam and to see the world and see really exotic places and uh, this is what we want to continue. Helsinki continua a stupirci e Land Made sembra la parola d'ordine di una città in continua evoluzione. Made in Caglio è il posto migliore dove incontrare i makers, uno spazio dove si collabora, si condividono macchine, ci si scambiano idee e si creano progetti in grado di rilanciare uno dei più antichi quartieri della città. The idea behind Made in Caglio is to 
connect a lot of unused resources and talents and, and skills and uh, energies of, of different uh, crafts and, and local producers and, and try to um, create something bigger than the sum of its parts. The name Made in Kallio already tells a lot. It's like a local brand, local, local activities. Very different people and that's one of our ideas that uh, we are not concentrated on uh, media people or uh, handicraft people or, of shoes or jewelry or something. We, we, uh, we want to have them all. The idea is to have different kind of talents and skills and then make something bigger and better together. Why you came here to do your bags? Well, first of all, we were invited to come here and uh, we thought that this environment is very inspiring and we can uh, contribute to, to Made in Kalia movement um, ourselves and we found it very interesting, a very interesting place to be and very interesting people to work with. Kalia in Helsinki is a very special place. It's, it's kind of like um, street art roots or how you would call it. This Kallio is about that we want to create our own little world here and to where we can share ideas and be creative and maybe start our own businesses. And be tolerant and that's what actually Bagnanas is about is, is being tolerant and, and respect any kind of uh, ideas or any kind of movement. So this is a very open-minded place and, and we want to be part of it. I'm a woodworker, my company's name is Poo Guru which means wood guru in English and I do uh, woodworking, furniture and besides I try to develop my own products and materials. Technically it's possible to do like cooperation of course and uh, that would be perfect. We, I think we should try to push that more but as uh, but in like maybe even more important is just inspiration that people are working on their own own things and it's it's good to be together um, my goal is like to uh, push the boundaries of woodworking um, like work together with artists and just develop crazy stuff and it's definitely that there are so many like designers and handcraft people all together and it's such a nice such an inspiring yeah. place like if you don't have some machine or something you can maybe borrow it or then you can make exchanges when you while your products and stuff like that in Helsinki there is like opportunities for people a lot now they are oh. there there is like people that are ha holding different kind of workshops and you can like cooperate with the part of the town that you're living in and for example, here in Made in Gallo, they have also like sewing machines and stuff like that that people can buy, uh, come to rent and stuff like or to make it here and they're arranging all these workshops. So it's definitely on the air all the time and like there is all the time some workshops and DIY happenings. It's really, really popular now in here and it's really nice. It's a really good fashion, what I think. Helsinki is a, is a, a very vibrant city at the moment. Uh, I lived abroad for a long time. When I met him, he said, well, I'm maximum one year here and then I'm, <laughs> I'm going to New York and, or somewhere else, but uh, it's yeah. three years now and uh, yeah, and, 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 still and you're still there, yeah. and, <laughs> no packing. And, uh, well, we are welcoming everybody to come here and uh, use their skills and uh, be, be creative and uh, do it yourself culture again. Yeah, yeah just, just improvise have fun and, and do something that has not been done in, in uh, Finland before and almost create an autonomous zone here within the city where you know everything is possible even though uh, at this point everything is not possible you know. Il Maker Tour continua ad attraversare l'Europa. Lasciamo la Finlandia, atterriamo a Berlino e ci spostiamo verso il nord della Germania per imbarcarci verso Malmo. La Svezia è la nostra nuova tappa. Qui ci aspetta Stoplen, un open house che ospita un co-working, un palco per eventi, una bike kitchen, un laboratorio di cucito, un fab lab, molti creativi e idee da sviluppare. Una di queste è Alterscopa, 
un laboratorio di riuso in cui materiali industriali tessili di scarto vengono trasformati dai bambini e dai più grandi in pupazzi, oggetti utili o personaggi di storie fantastiche. Karen è la mente creativa dietro il progetto, convinta di poter trasformare i suoi studenti in perfetti makers. My name is uh, Karen and uh, <laughs> I work at the, this material bank and uh, creative lab called Återskapa. Uh, why you choose to work here? Okay, I, I was staying in Los Angeles for two years with my family and during these years I found uh, something called Discover, uh, Rediscover Center and Trash for Teaching uh, while I was working as a teacher at the Swedish school. So when I uh, moved back to Malmö about two years ago i decided to quit my job as a teacher and try to uh, start Återskapa. So one day I was uh, walking by Stapen and I didn't know what it, what it was. So I got inside and there was a big sign uh, saying, uh, Do you, uh, have you got any creative ideas? I had this Återskapa idea. So, uh, um, i was talking to Caroline, who was in charge here, and uh, she was interested in my idea. So uh, we decided to find financial support for Återskapa. It's very fun to be a teacher when you are speaking and telling a story. You always have something to talk about. Uh, you never know what the kids are planning to do here, and they are more creative than the adults. <laughs> so you are trying to make uh, children as makers of the future? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think they are more, more fun. <laughs> I think the goal with Återskapa uh, is to encourage uh, creativity and uh, our, our environmental thinking. Un dipartimento tessile, un workshop per bambini, un hacker space, una ciclofficina e un coworking. Questo è Stoplen e al suo interno Fabriken, un'officina dove makers di ogni tipo si incontrano per creare. Oyuki e Anna ci raccontano come è nato il primo Fab Lab di Malmo. My name is Oyuki Matsumoto and I'm the project manager for uh, Stoppelbeden and uh, working closely with uh, Fabriken. What is uh, the idea behind uh, this project? Stoppelbeden, the whole concept with Stoppelbeden, it's a possibility arena, we used to call it, and what we do is we attract people uh, inside the cultural uh, environment, but the idea here is that it's the users who produce uh, their events or their exhibitions or in the case of Fabriken, their products. It's different generations that get together. Uh, for example, F Fabriken attracts people all between, I don't know, 15 up to 60. So you, you see all these uh, people that come from different generations working together and teaching, teaching each other. And uh, also it's nice to see that people have realized that they can not only go and buy a product, but they can make it themselves. My name is Anna Seravalli. I am a designer uh, and then I happen to be a researcher, a design researcher who had the, uh, the luck of ending up in working at and with Fabriken here in, in Malmo. Between May 2010 and April 2011 was the, uh, a year in which we uh, tried different ways of uh, basically designing together the space and we did some like more um, like sitting together at the table together with people from Stappen, external actors to try to decide what the space should be about, which kind of machines we have to, bo to buy. So instead uh, we decided to uh, adopt another strategy and try to uh, do events, to do activities uh, even before the space was available. Uh, to try to involve people from Malmo and to see, okay, what you would like to do here? What is a Fab Lab in Malmo? What is about? What is possible to do here? What is interesting for the people living here? Many of the big companies will have to realize uh, how to um, cover the new needs of uh, people that are not only wanting to consume, but they also want to create. 
For your experience and from your point of view, what is a fab lab today? It's important uh, to develop a good and uh, a true relationship with uh, the contest uh, where it's located. Most of the people who come here, uh, they come here because it's, uh, it's their passion, uh, because they like uh, to come here, spend time making things, spend time meeting people and learn from each other. Uh, but I think we should be really, really careful there in, in, in deciding what are Fab Labs maker spaces or hacker spaces or this kind of space is about. If it's, is it about economic growth, only economic growth, or it's about some kind of uh, social uh, value production, human value production, so learning skills. Um, there are different uh, um, activities going on and I think it's, it's uh, it's some kind of uh, important that there are these different levels. My personal goal with this place is to see it running properly and uh, that we can uh, offer workshops for uh, all kinds of uh, people and ages uh, where they learn to use the machines that we have and the tools that we have and uh, also see more girls uh, join the makeup movement. Il Maker Tour si ferma a Malmo. Dentro Stoplen c'è il Werkstad Arduino, officina nella quale creativi, designer, tecnici e maker si incontrano per immaginare e fare oggetti utili e divertenti, usando la scheda che ha reso il mondo della digital fabrication facile per tutti. What I do with Arduino is really mostly educational things we build things and to teach other people uh, i'm a uh, designer so i basically design the three not the 3d models but different anything they need really <laughs> just um, if they need a, a wind turbine uh, i will design that so this is the kind of stuff that i'll design and she does most of the electronic stuff i just make it look pretty when I was at the university studying to become an interaction designer, my favorite thing in that uh, education was Arduino. I've always been fascinated by it, so when I heard that they had a laser cutter in Stoplin, I was super, super excited and I met Davey, um, a friend of ours, mine, and um, uh, he showed me how to use a laser cutter and then I was really super interested about Arduino and then I found out that the co-founder of Arduino uh, was here, so I was like super excited to meet him. What I see is the ability to share. I mean, I didn't know very much when I came into it. The thing is that I've never done anything outside of this community sort of because the education at uh, Malmö Högskola is very much just learn by doing and whatever you do share with your uh, classmates and other students so uh, um, yeah to me it's 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 sort of when I've done stuff like this it's always been like this it measures temperature and humidity and also it measures wind speed so this is 3D printed. Well, okay, it doesn't actually measure the wind speed, but it measures Rotation. the rotations per second. And so it'll be able to take pictures of the users uh, that as they pull the string, they will be able to see what's below them or directly at the angle. Yeah. So it'll be fun, aerial photography. And all the data is gathered on a micro SD card here so that they can put the data into a processing sketch. Uh, so it will be visualized. This one, for instance, is a light chaser, and they wanted, uh, at first, the, the way they drew it was just simple block with wheels. Just like a car. <laughs> and I we thought, <laughs> what chases the sun? And so I put a cloud in it. Like, as soon as you can think of something that you want, you make, and that's the coolest part. I, was, I just got a new Kindle, and I, I really wanted to read with one hand. Um, so I decided, I'm going to make clips. And within like an hour, I was able to make a way to uh, hold it. Well, I think that um, it's going to, it's gaining a lot of interest and more and more people are going to learn it. The skill set isn't necessarily there yet, but lots more people are going to want to build their own things and I think maybe inspire more creativity. Well, I've never been to a Maker Faire, but I really want to go to see, to see all the stuff that's there. Uh, both what, what people are making and also what, what I could get to, to make stuff. <laughs>
Yeah. Really. Uh, my name is Tony Olsson, uh, and uh, yeah, what I do, yeah, I consider myself like a maker of things. Uh, that's like the only way I can explain it. Like one day I'm building like a normal chair, and the next day I'm like installing an interactive toilet. Uh, but most days you find me at the university teaching physical prototyping. When you really started to work on projects that today we can call uh, maker project. Ooh. I think it's of like many makers. It started when I was like really young, like breaking stuff, like always opening old radios, never been figured like able to put them back together. Uh, and then I went into like tra uh, traditional arts, like always creative, trying to like build stuff. But again, traditional arts was like too traditional for me. And then I like I moved and started studying interaction design. And this is like when I first uh, became aware that you could actually do fun stuff with electronics. Uh, and slowly, when I got introduced to it, uh, like the community was the like biggest difference. Like active people, uh, like welcomed you with open arms and shared their knowledge in a way that was like. Pretty exciting. You like bring inside the university what you was uh, knowing outside the university. So how it happened? At the university level, I think at K3 in Malmö, like they realized they couldn't keep up with what was happening outside of the university. So I think they made a smart choice, like opening up the doors for the outside world and bringing their knowledge into the university and actually using them and uh, implementing it into teaching. And that's what I teach, like physical prototyping one, two, and three. So there's like a pretty extensive physical prototyping uh, twist on the interaction design education in Malmo uh, compared to other educations in Sweden. And I think most of the world, like a lot of physical prototyping stuff, was basically based out of uh, hacker knowledge. My name is Christian and I'm the chairman of the Swedish Human Powered Vehicle Association. Uh, it's a very much do-it-yourself world. So we have uh, a lot of people trying out new designs and uh, building uh, different kinds of, of vehicles that are propelled just by, by human power. Uh, it's really started in the US in the 70s, uh, on, in the first oil crisis. And people wanted to find other means of transport that didn't need oil or uh, an external energy source. So people started experimenting with uh, recumbent bicycles. The movement has, has then spread to all the continents in the world. Uh, people started to do, build their own bikes and trying out new designs to find the, the perfect design. So yes, I think there's, this is a way of uh, not having to have a large international corporation uh, producing something, but it can be made locally by enthusiasts. Developed world, Western world, we, we use too much energy, uh, not only uh, fossil fuel, but also electricity. So we need to start thinking different. And uh, bicycles and recumbent bicycles are a part of that. People should be able to take their bike whenever they want and go wherever they want, just like with, with a car. <laughs> Il Maker Tour attraversa l'Europa del Nord e dopo la Svezia fa tappa a Copenaghen. Nella capitale danese il primo incontro con la comunità Makers è al Kultur Valbi. Qui Signe, con un gruppo di tecnici, apre il Copenaghen Fab Lab, un luogo accessibile di condivisione per dare ai cittadini la possibilità di prototipare e creare qualsiasi progetto. We chose to, to open a fab lab in this uh, cultural center because we already have a lot of workshops inside this house. In the last two or three years, we saw a lot of uh, new people coming using our workshops. That could be young people and old people and children and so on. So we thought that here's probably a need that we could, be, um, we could, could uh, help fulfilling. Thinking about all those um, creative uh, people around us. I mean, just normal people, children or whatever, have a lot of uh, ideas that if they could be made as a prototype or whatever, or maybe the ideas 
should not just only be ideas inside our heads, maybe we should use them and, and make them real. And a fab lab is just a laboratory that can help people realize their ideas. And we believe that there are a lot of ideas out there, and that not only by professionals, but ordinary people or children or whatever. With that, we want to open up the possibilities to use new technology, and it's free here. In, in the libraries already, there was free and open access, so it's just extending it to the fab lab as well, uh, which for us made good sense. About 14 days after we, we opened up, we had a, a, a grand meeting asking for volunteers. And immediately 40 people turned up saying, I want to volunteer, I want to share my knowledge with everyone else who comes to here. And our um, aim is to promote the sharing between citizens. We have a, a great potential there. The, the mega movement is uh, capable of changing our society. All this sharing is uh, touching our way of thinking about economy. I think there's a lot of uh, potential for, for changing our way of, of thinking society. One, this uh, idea of, of sharing is also a way of socializing. And also the, uh, the production, it doesn't have to be like you have to make 10 million copies of one thing uh, in order to make a little bit of money. Now you have to make maybe 100 copies of something and then you can make the money. Uh, the entire production uh, network is being, being, uh, is being decreased, uh, being smaller, uh, and, and making it easier uh, for someone who has a great idea, you can share it and make it some, a bit of money as well. Yeah. If you look at all of some of the other hacker spaces in Copenhagen, they're great, totally great. But you have to be kind of nerdy uh, to, to come there. You have to be maybe uh, a special type. And, and by placing uh, a fab lab like this in a cultural center where, it's, where everybody can come, it's, it's uh, working together with libraries where practically everybody comes. So my name is Simona Maschi, I'm from Italy but I live here in Copenhagen and I'm in uh, charge of CID. Uh, I used to work in a research center and school in Ivrea in Italy and um, I was there for about five years and uh, then uh, I married a Danish guy, <laughs> so I, I was on my way to Denmark. We thought, why don't we start our own new thing from scratch? And uh, I was coming here because I was, uh, again, for love, but they said, you know, we don't have any one to, we're fine, we're free to come. So we were six people and a dog, Leonardo. We had the vision for a new place uh, based on innovation, design, technology, but especially prototyping and making. And uh, we came at the right time. At that very time, the Danish government was uh, investing uh, uh, funding and money for new initiatives like that to be started. We found like the possibility to start what we had in mind, this vision. And the vision was to have a place which would um, host people from all over the world, being very international, and run activities across education, research and consulting. This idea of crafting and doing things with your hands and uh, being in dialogue with the person who will eventually use that thing, whether it's you yourself making it, or maybe your friend or your family, I don't know. Now we're, of course, like talking as it was the new thing, but actually that very way of doing, like the craftsmanship and making things with your hands, is that is like what people have been doing for the last, uh, I don't know how many thousands here. And it's only for the last uh, two centuries that people moved to an industrial uh, uh, scale and making things through machines. but. Being engaged in the making and being in the dialogue with the people who will use that thing is the thing we've been doing for the longest. We should learn a lot from what the craftsmen used to do and try to um, bring into like the, the new framework we have with new technologies and new machineries and new open source technologies. Simona, you have a dream? Yes, many. <laughs> The next one is to, or like one that we are growing together here, is to have a, uh, actually, we don't know what it is. So far we call it Nest, like a nest, where the people who are affiliated to CID can stay and, and, and get ready to fly at some point. So it could be something close in the, to an incubator kind of environment, where basically uh, people who come to CID or a part of CID can develop their own projects. So maybe 
the dream is like what can we learn from a place like this or like from activities and the mindset and then really spread it in situations where the needs are a little bit more urgent. My name is Sara Salsinha, I come from Portugal. Uh, my background is in graphic design so this is, uh, since I've been here is my first approach to um, boards and connecting uh, uh, wires and on this project we've created the beat radio which um, lets us know when we are um, sliding down and it shows us uh, the beats per minute of the song that is playing on that moment. My name is Nils, uh, I'm from Denmark. Uh, I used to, well I had a, have a background in interaction design and this is Ritika. And our project uh, is a very uh, almost mind experiment. We are putting intelligence, haptic force feedback into food, made in a state and an example of how food could talk back to you. Uh, if it's still good enough to eat, if it's too old, if it's going bad, you can feel the force feedback in this uh, almost like uh, linear draw, draw like uh, pull is getting harder and harder. I'm Otto Wormink and this is Neha, Neha Park. And uh, I'm from the Netherlands, Neha is from India. And uh, we've been working for two days on this small project about haptic feedback. What we try to figure out is like, can we get a sense of touch simply by having friction on the finger while I'm moving my finger over a display? So I'm feeling the contour of my own face basically as I'm moving up and down. Uh, my name's Luke and I'm from the UK and our project we wanted to look at weather and we wanted to try and find ways of listening to the weather or feeling the weather or understanding the weather so that we could know I mean for us when we got up in the morning we, is it raining is it cold outside and how can we get that information I'm Lesser this is Baha um, We've had a couple of days to um, build a project with the music and motors, and we decided to focus on uh, the, um, using generating something that can um, help the blind. So we've made a, a scanner device, a handheld device that's uh, that you can move anywhere. It can be on my body. It can be on any any kind of surface, and it can um, it can um, it analyzes the it analyzes the color. And then it outputs a sound depending on what kind of color it is. And it, out it outputs a sequence of colors in RGB values, reds, greens, and, uh, and blues. With a little bit of tweaking, you should be able to um, like hear, this, hear the colors. So I'm Daniel Mahal uh, from Norway. I uh, did this project with Sasa Sula from Holland. So we built um, a pendulum. Uh, it's an abstract concept, I guess. Um, which uh, has a haptic feedback from the pendulum, so the controls and the, and the actually actual physics are separated. In addition to that, it creates sound uh, based on uh, the motion of the pendulum and the force that the controls is giving you. This is Priyanka and I'm Shamik. Uh, we are from India. Uh, we chose to focus on kitchen and cooking products. And we realized that uh, these days induction cookers have become very common. But induction cookers also take away a lot of the feedback or the feedback systems that are associated with cooking, like being with feeling the heat or you know feeling really the fire. Oh, I'm Angelo Gantala, I'm from New York. I'm Pierluigi Della Rosa, I'm from Italy. So we had the idea to create a jukebox and uh, we thought about a lot of concepts that are already present in how music is delivered and presented to us and personalized and customized through uh, mediums like iTunes or Spotify. When you're scrolling through songs or when you're choosing songs, um, this controller or this device is actually guiding you towards selections that um, may be more relevant, may be recommended through friends, maybe new releases or, or like most listened to songs by like close people in your network. Uh, my name is Ole Stabe and I'm from Denmark. Uh, our project uh, is based on to make how to make the snooze function in a regular wake-up clock tangible. Is an alarm clock without a speaker at the moment. In the end, when you want to turn it off, you need to stand up 
because then you do the last piece which is turning the clock off uh, and just pushing the cloud up a little bit.